Hi, my name is Andrzej Tucholski and I'm a cultural and lifestyle blogger from Poland, Europe. I've had the unique opportunity to chat a little with Hugh Howie, the Amazon's best-selling science fiction writer and privately a guy who sometimes randomly pops up on a reader's party. Since English isn't my first language and while well, being Hugh's huge fan made me ungodly stressed out just before the interview, I would like to apologize for my further language mistakes. Sorry. Uh, but hey, you are here for his knowledge and not my moderation. Let's start. Um, Hugh Howie, you have written Molly Fight Saga, Silo Saga, a few standalone novels, and a 9-11, lastly, a highly recognized novelette based, uh, well, based on a Kurt Vonnegut philosophy. Uh, you also reply to your own emails, what I am a case of, and travel around the world. How do you set up your workflow? Like, how do you operate <laughs> with this variety of artistic duties? Um, that's a good question. I I wish I learned um, from someone else how to do this. I'm kind of making it up as I go. It just requires um, not having a social life, uh, <laughs> not, not taking any time off. Um, like, a typical day for me is very can be very strange. Today, I'm... Um, um, I was packing up uh, books to ship out all night last night um, at the post office today. And, and while I have books on the counter for them to pack, I'm going out and doing phone conferences. And you just take care of as many things as you can at once. And So it's just massive multitasking. <clears throat> yeah, it's a lot of multitasking. But for me, the most important thing is when I have something that needs to get done, I do it right then. I don't um, make a list or put it off and let let that unfinished task weigh on me. Mm -hmm. um, I was the same way as a student in college. <clears throat> when I had a teacher assign a paper, um, my goal was to go home and, and write the whole paper that night. And because I knew, I knew I was going to do it in one night anyway. So instead of waiting until the night before it was due, I would just do it that night. And that way I didn't have 20 things <laughs> weighing on me. It was just, well, that's, you know, that's a special way to be a student. <laughs> Um, so, well, you are successful as we can see, but if you could start this adventure once again, is there anything you would do differently? Yeah, um, a few things I think. I mean, my biggest regret looking back at my writing career is that I waited so late to get started. I, I wanted to write since I was 12 and it took me uh, 20 years to finish my first manuscript and I was terrified of writing a rough draft and it not being perfect. I was terrified of how long it would take to finish that manuscript. And there are a lot of books I would have written in my college days and while I was a sailor that would have been very different and I think better than anything I could write going forward. And and those, those books are lost to me now. So I wish I would have done that earlier. And I wish I would have started with self-publishing. My, um, my first experience was to query agents and to go with a small publisher and uh, I saw the trends that were starting back in 2009, and um, I wish I would have been brave enough to uh, to, to try it on my own uh, with my very first book. Okay. And, and right now, what's your favorite experience from writing? Like, maybe you have some funny story. Maybe you've met a sports <laughs> superstar, or I know, rode a dolphin <laughs> with a reader. <laughs> I, you know, it, it has been cool. I've met some of my heroes and, and, and met some of my um, uh, just people I really look up to as writers. Um, but I think my interactions with, with readers are the things that I'll remember the most. Um, I've been able to surprise a few readers along the way with chance encounters and, and showing up at, at, uh, parties or, uh, taking, <laughs> taking them out to lunch and, um, doing the meetups, um, which I do when I'm in uh, big cities. And I think years from now, when I look back, it'll be, the, um, the the encounters that I've had with readers like that that I'll I'll look for, uh, you know I think that's that'll be the highlight of, of my writing career. And to give two things, the traveling has been amazing just to see so much of the world, um, and, and that really is combined with with seeing readers. But being able to be, go all over Europe and Australia, and I'm going in, to Taiwan uh, in a couple of weeks, and uh, these are. Um, brilliant experiences and, and writing has afforded me that so the sailor habit is still strong in you <laughs> yeah i don't i don't really like sitting still i can do it for a little while but then i get antsy and i want to um see something new and do something new so the cool thing about writing is each book is like a new career and so it's the first 
um, career I've had where I feel constantly stimulated. Um, I'm working on a ch children's book right now, you know, which is completely different. So I, I can't, I, there's no way to get bored. There's always something else I can do within this industry. Okay. And since we're speaking about industry, let's talk business for a moment. Your success came from self-publishing and eBooks. However, in Poland, and I suppose a lot of other countries, you're mostly known from only the Silo Saga because it has been published by a huge publishing house. Mm -hmm. um, what's your take on that? Would you rather like to have the KDP admin panel for every country in the world? Or do you like to operate with these normal, I suppose, divisions? I love working with foreign publishers. They're they operate a lot differently than domestic publishers here in the U.S. Um, their contracts are very simple. They're they're very um, because they have their smaller markets. They're more directly connected with their bookstores and their readers, and they're able to take chances. They'll do things like give away the first book for free, the first part of of uh, the Silo Saga for free. They'll break it up into parts the way I did. They'll do really unusual and and creative uh, marketing strategies that you don't see in the U.S. because we just have a big market and we take it for granted that if we do a certain number of things, the book will do well. Um, I, you know, the best thing about working with foreign publishers is these books have to be rewritten from scratch. Um, translating a book, it's not like putting it in Google Translator and having it spit <laughs> something out. Like You have to have someone who's fluent in both languages, English and the the language is going to be published in, and they have to be a great writer as well. They have to take a, what the idea of a sentence and write it beautifully. And I, I've had success in Taiwan, like I can't believe. I mean, I was one of their uh, the top selling fiction authors there last year, and I <laughs> I know, but I credit a lot of that with having a wonderful translator. And I there's no way I could go pick 30 translators and market in 30 different countries. So I value this partnership, um, and I. While I don't really have a U.S. publisher um, that I think of as like being my publisher, um, I, I feel like I'm publishing here in the U.S. and then I have partnerships with publishers all over the world. Nice. Um, how do you cope with trust to a translator? I mean, you can't like you know see if the work is done well. <laughs> well, the good thing is you know you're you're not just trusting a translator; you're trusting your agent who knows the publisher that you're going with. Uh, I, I couldn't have, I couldn't do this without Jenny Meyer, my overseas agent, Great Tan, who who works in the uh, Asian market. Um, they but they know these publishers and what their track record is and how they, you know, who they use for their translators, um, what they've published in the past, how well those books have done. So I have them. I have the publisher themselves, which you develop a relationship with, and uh, and then you have the translator. All these people have the same goal, which is to make the reader happy. So. It, it, it's really when you trust a team of people, it's it's much easier than just trusting one person, you know. Right. Um, do you plan to sell global rights to some of your other books? Maybe. Yeah, I'm I'm open for conversations about um, any of my works, uh, and we've had some interest expressed from my back catalog. I, you know, I haven't had time to promote any of that. I've been so busy working on the next thing. But if I ever slow down, I would love to take some of my books that have been very popular in the U.S., like the Mollified series and Halfway Home, and, and go to foreign publishers and say, hey, no one in your country has read this, and it, it might be some of my best work, so would you be interested in publishing this? Okay, <laughs> we're waiting. Um, also, um, we have writers who are completely in favor of, you know, old publishing houses and so on. We have those completely guerrilla writers who just hate brick and mortar stores and, you know, only Amazon. And you are kind of in the middle. Like you are the ambassador of, of connection, of some relationship between the old model and the new model. What's, uh, in your opinion, the next step in this evolution? What must be solved? Well, uh, the, the next step for writers is to stop uh, thinking about um, what, like which team is right, which one's wrong, because mm -hmm. The, the bigger self-publishing gets, the more it's going to start looking like traditional publishing. And you'll, you'll already see uh, indie writers saying we need some way of designating which books are good and which ones aren't. You know, they, they, they're starting to talk like they want gatekeepers, which I think is very dangerous. And you're seeing traditional publishers act more like small presses and independent authors. So if we, if we say that one team is always right and the other team is always wrong – when those teams start to act the same, we're going to look ridiculous, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's important to, to keep in mind that this is just 
we're trying to deliver stories to readers. We're trying to deliver stories to an audience. Mm-hmm. How that happens is irrelevant. What's important is that it happens as smoothly and fairly as possible. And so there are things that both, you know, self-publishers need to do a better job of putting out the best work and being patient and, and editing and getting um, a good cover and putting out work that will make the reader happy. Traditional publishers need to work more closely with authors mm-hmm. to get um, you know prices down, get rid of DRM, uh, get um, the contracts to be more fair. So I, I just see that these forces are going to come together because we now have competition. We never had competition in publishing before. It was <laughs> it was a big publishing house or it was nothing, and so they didn't have any impetus to change, and readers didn't have choice. And what self-publishing is doing is it's allowing publishers to see um, something they can emulate and it's allow readers uh, to apply financial pressure to say, like, this is what we want from, from you all. And it's up to writers and publishers to get together and say, hey, this is what the readers demand. How can we deliver that? Mm-hmm. So generally, generally, you say that the huge publishing houses, they can treat uh, so that- little stuff publishers as some sort of guinea pigs, right? Absolutely. And, you know, learn from them, learn from the market. I mean, um, the reason uh, publishers are, are publishing uh, as much erotica and romance <laughs> now as, they, as yeah. they are is because they've learned from an interaction between readers and self-publishers. So there's free market research that they're now making tens of millions of dollars, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars off of because we provided – a uh, a black market to show them what the demand was. Um, the same thing is is true of science fiction. Publishers are not publishing enough science fiction. And if That's you look true. at That's true. The, yeah, I mean, look at the bestseller list on Amazon. Someone sent me a, a screen grab today, uh, a reader showing the top six authors in science fiction, and not on ebooks, but but physical books. The top six authors are all self published authors. And that means publishers aren't doing their job. They're not listening to what readers want. They're they're trying to allow. Uh, they're hoping that Tor and Orbit and the science fiction publishers will handle that demand, but they can't. Um, the people who love these stories can read a lot of them, and that means there are authors out there who aren't getting the, the publishing deals they deserve. And I I would love to see that change. Um, in your opinion, how a writer who is not so good with internet he doesn't or she doesn't understand facebook and twitter how this kind of writer can succeed in modern publishing um i think there's a couple of ways to go about it one well there's i can think of three ways um one is to say uh, look i don't like to market i don't like to to put myself out there i don't like to to talk uh publicly with people and I, i'm not comfortable with computers if you have that attitude there's nothing wrong with that but just know that you're probably going to be writing for a passion and not for a career. Um, there's no guarantee. There's, it's, it'd be like someone coming into work and saying, hey, I like working, but I don't like like putting on pants in the morning. Um, well, putting on pants is going to be a requirement for coming into work. <laughs> and if you don't like to do that, you know, you got to stay at home and, and find your own job. And if, if writers are going to say, like, I don't want to do these things, but those things are now expected of every writer, whether you're with a traditional publisher or not, it's going to be hard to have a, a career at this. Right. Um, the second thing you can do is, yeah, you don't like doing these things. No one likes writing a query letter or no one likes, um, there's no one likes writing a blurb or a, uh, a synopsis. Or there going to you, a post office. <laughs> or going to a post office. There are things you have to, to do if you want to be successful. So to learn them, tackle them one at a time. Don't be scared of them and, and do as much as you can. Um, it doesn't take a whole lot. You know, you, you need a website, you need to probably blog and have a Facebook page and use Twitter and, and maybe put some videos together, just introducing yourself to readers. Um, and, and so get comfortable with that. The, the last option, and this is one I, I don't think anyone's tried that mm-hmm. it would be interesting to, to see someone experiment with, would be to partner with someone who, who does enjoy those things and say, look, I don't have a career yet, but read some of my stuff and you can see. I can write. My writing is great. My stories are great. Um, what I need is someone to help me get the word out there. So let's work together and take a chance on each other. And if 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 we can get uh, a career going, then 
you know, I'll cut you in on 15% of, of all my earnings, you know? Um, so treat them like an agent, but a, a social media agent. So that, and I think that's, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, sorry. I, I just think that might be something someone tries down the road where they say, look, it's, there's so much to do there. Why don't, it might be a spouse. It might be, you know, um, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, spouses kind of quit their day jobs and work with their writing spouse to manage their career. So um, a friend of mine, um, Robin Sullivan, does that for her uh, husband, Michael Sullivan. She became his publisher, and that allows Michael to just write. That's a cool partnership, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, so let's say we have a young writer with a book. So in your opinion, should he go to the publishing house and try at least or just start off from the Amazon? Uh, it depends on several things. It depends on what, what, he, what that writer wants out of their career. Um, do they want to be in bookstores? Is that more important than maybe earning a living as a writer? Um, then you, do they want to just know if they have what it takes? If they, do they want the... Um, the uh, Uh, th- that feeling of um, having passed a test, you know, from a publisher. Yeah. If so, go that route. Just know it might take you years to get a publishing deal and another year to see your book out. And so that's what you're investing in. Um, for the uh, people who want to go the other way, I mean, uh, there's there's a lot of pros and cons. I mean, you in, in some ways you can spend more of your time just writing as a self-published writer because you – You finish your book, you publish it, and you work on the next one. You don't even have to think about that book. It's, it's not. There's no expiration date on it. It's going to be available forever. Um, and that was my attitude going in. I thought I'm just going to spend 10 years writing and develop and have a whole pile of books, and then I can tell people about them. Slight change of topic. What inspires you the most when you write? There's traveling. What's more? Um, the thing I think that the thing that inspires me the most is um, just my curiosity about human nature and and the life that we live on this planet. I think it's I think it's fascinating. I I view life almost um, like a biologist or maybe an alien landing here and saying like, or how maybe a good psychologist. Yeah, or a psychologist. <laughs> um, it's uh, I, I want to understand as much of this life as possible before I die, and writing gives me an opportunity to um, digest the things that I learned from my writing and my observations and my travels and, and reading the paper every day and, and, and being interested in world events. I can take all of that and say something about the world. And maybe when people read my stories, they're just reading the adventure story on the surface. But I, I, hear, I get emails from people who are reading what I'm really writing about and they appreciate that. And that's such a that's a huge reward. Yeah, like the reviews after the Amber uh, PC number. Yeah, man. They, uh, I, I, I was so nervous putting that story out there, and then every almost every review I read, it just makes me tear up and sometimes bawl. I mean, it's just people who um, w- read the story and understood really what I was trying to say, and I, I didn't know if that would if that would happen or not. So it's. That's been one of the most rewarding things in my uh, writing career is releasing that story and, and getting the, the feedback and the private emails that I've received. Yeah, well, actually, it's one of the um, pros uh, of the ebook era that you can just publish a short novelette. It wouldn't be so possible with the normal publishing, you know. Yeah, how? Ex- exactly. Um, the print cost would be too much, and, and no one would pay for that. I mean, I this is... Um, I just have one of these sitting beside my desk. This is part four of Sand, yeah. and I've released this novel in um, in five parts. And readers have really enjoyed, um, you know, getting at the the story in pieces. And you mm-hmm. can't. There's no way you could do that with publishing with bookstores. So, yeah, the cool thing about eBooks is you could release a very short story. You could release, you know, a ten book series all in one file. And and readers don't know. Um, uh, they they just read the length of the story. It doesn't matter to them how thick it is. Okay. And the final question: What are you currently reading? Um, I just finished a book called Hyperbole and a Half, and it's um it's kind of a cartoon book. It's one of the funniest things I've ever read. Um, it's uh, uh the the artist and the author had a blog where she had these cartoons, but she talks about um, her childhood and 
raising dogs and different adventures that she's been in. And um, it was really like a autobiography, but it was, I was laughing out loud on the airplane yesterday and everyone is like, you know, I was making a scene, but I can't help it. It's just one of the funniest books. It's There's also a very, crazy writer out there. <laughs> it's also a very sad and poignant book at times. I mean, it, uh, it, it was an emotional roller coaster. It's called Hyperbole and a Half, and I loved it. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for your time.